Good evening, live from the LCAC studios. Uh, this is Michael Shivik here with State Senator Michael O'Moore, and we're here to talk about some serious issues. We're in your corner, the Citizens' Corner. Uh, Mike, welcome back to the town of Leicester. LCAC studios, not your first time here. I remember going back, oh, 2008, I think we started coming in, yes. 2009. Um, doing some shows here. So, uh, you know, it's a pleasure to be here with you. Thanks for coming in. No, it's my pleasure. It's nice to be here again. Thank you. No, Thank so you. You know, there's been a lot of issues going on in town, so Absolutely. it's nice to be here just to reminisce and talk about all the stuff going on. Yeah. Uh, community's been active, you know, some good, some bad, and we're just going. Well, forward. we always see you around, and uh, we appreciate the work that you're doing. Oh, thank and, you. And, um, you know, let's talk budget, you know. Um, well, before we talk budget, I Yeah. Let's um, go right into the meat and potatoes here. What do you got? Go the meat and potatoes. I think. I said the mic before the show started. He should change the name. It says with the host, <laughs> Mike Shiv. He said he should change the name to the host, the Shiv. The Shiv. The Shiv. I, I suggested the Shiv but the Shiv might work. No, I think the Shiv is nice and short. People remember that. Yeah, I the think shiv. they do remember the Shiv. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I think they so. do. Well pointed. In any case, no pun intended. Um, <laughs> all right, so. Oh, and I do want to, ex please excuse me. I, yeah, I have a cold, fine. so if I get into a little coughing episode here, I. I want to apologize ahead of time. No sick days for the senator. <coughs> Excuse me, no. That's what I like to see. So I just want to remind people that all access to all of your 2015 and 2016 legislative session accomplishments are available on your website, senatormikemore.com. Now let's talk a little bit about Lester here and uh, FY17, Lester allocation. I mean, uh, so, so how are we doing at the State House this year? Are we going up? Are we going back? What's going on? Well, the, um, we're expected revenue growth again, not as, it's not as, I um, think it's big as we everyone would hope it to be. I think one of the, you know one of the dilemmas facing everyone, what everyone's trying to figure out is that um, the administration is trying to, I guess, um, determine where the um, the problem is. But we've got one of the, one of the lowest unemployment rates, at I think we're at uh, was it 3.9 percent now or 3.6 percent, and um, revenue expectations is not coming in where everyone thought it would be. Mm -hmm. you know, last year we thought we were going to be having, I think, 4.3% and then they're coming in at 29 or 3%. Now we're looking at, I think, again, um, somewhere in the twos for revenue growth. So yet, you, you, normally during um, job growth that we're having, yeah. um, again, Massachusetts, if you look over the last eight years since the Great Recession, um, we've gone from 8%, we're now under 4 and the revenue growth is not meeting the expectations that you, that normally would be met. So it's trying to determine where where where, where, the, where the gap is. So now you said um, after the Great Recession, though, it's my recollection, you took office right at that time, at that very tumultuous time. Yes, I did. An open seat, and you you know you were in the in the primary, and you know in the general, and uh, you know going to the state house, getting sworn in. What was that like going into such a, a I guess a, a difficult situation that, <coughs> as a first term senator? Well, you know it was. Um, it wasn't the, um, the situation I think that I wanted to be in. When I first, I think you remember when I first started running in the early part of um, January of 2008 into the spring, um, all the revenue growth was good. Projections were good, everything was moving, the economy was, was, was moving great. It wasn't until like July or August that all of a sudden everything started to, to slow down. Mm -hmm. And then right around the primary, things just, Collapsed. And then in November, I think I remember looking at my <coughs> Apple phone, that sharp spike after an Obama was elected initially. Yeah, and then um, literally my first vote um, on swearing in was my first action was to raise my right hand, swear the oath, and then vote nine C cuts, um, allowing a billion dollars in tax cuts. Excuse me, a billion dollars in uh, cuts of funding. Now, that's tough. No, no one runs to go in there and you slash. Yep. Um, luckily, we luckily we didn't um, cut any local aid. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> I will say this: that only over over the last eight years of an office, the two line items that have consistently been increased has been our chapter seventy and our veterans services. That's great. Yeah. So those are two that have, we have never taken a cut. Uh, they may not have been into the um, the increases. Um, in the chapter 70 that you know some of our cities and towns would have been happy with. I know they would, the cities and towns want, would, would have liked to see a little bit more on the municipal side. Um, but even during the, the, the height of the, um, uh, the Great Recession, the Obama administration and the Congress had passed the, uh, 
the, um, the, ARRA. the ARRA, which allowed money to come back to the states that had to be used for education. Mm -hmm. So we were able to supplement what we had, and we had, and at that point we, we had I think two point three billion dollars mm -hmm. in our rainy day fund. Um, yeah, I remember that <coughs> <coughs> slashed yeah. down substantially. Yeah, it's, and now now we're about one point three, one point four. So we so were heading back up. We're climbing back up the ladder. There. Yeah, well, we're actually, we, we should be higher than we were. We, okay. we, we were kind of stationary the last. We've been over this level for the last like two or three years, and this is why they're looking at. <coughs> excuse me. This is why the bonding agencies are looking at us, trying to. Um, once he has tried to get back up to the two point, uh, the two billion dollar level. Okay. <coughs> Rainy days me. Yes, you have that in the coffers. Right, and you know one thing we did find out is that having the two point three billion dollars, um, if we didn't have that federal money to help supplement um, our Chapter Seventy funding, uh, we would that money wouldn't have lasted as long as we did. We were able to. We never. I, I don't think we went below a billion dollars, or we may have gone below a billion. Or just just under a billion dollars. In the rainy day fund. <coughs> yeah, in the rainy day fund, yep. and that um, that would have not been the case. If we didn't have that federal money coming in, we would have been a lot um, a lot lower than that, and we don't know whether, don't know really whether it would, would have sustained us the whole recession. But luckily, Massachusetts, we did make out better, and I will say we this. We better fiscal shape going into that than some other states. We were, and we actually, we, we were able to work through it a lot better. We, um, we made a lot of reforms. Um, that remember the DOT? I remember you guys got rid of the mass highway, which was <coughs> I went there with you. It was something that could never be touched. Um, yep. And here we are. You get that? You know, it's mass DOT now. So they kind of consolidated those extra positions. Yeah. Um, um, I'm trying to do a favor here. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, yeah, we, they combined all the different transportation agencies under one, under one umbrella, which had been tried for many years. Uh, we did that. We did. Um, was that an omnibus? Was it? Yeah, that was an, o yep. was an omnibus bill. We did yep. some. We did pension reform. There were five things. We did a tra so the transportation, pension. Um, God, I'm trying to remember. There were three other pieces: transportation, pension. Oh, we did an ethics bill. Yeah, I remember the um, ethics bill. Oh, we did a municipal reform package uh, to come back to allowing cities and towns a little more control and authority on certain things. And actually, we just did a, we just did another municipal reform bill uh, this last legislative session. Um, <clears throat> you know, hopefully, maybe we could see something again. Um, but it's, it's you know it's it's been in, in, interesting, and I, I do think that the work that we did it was it actually set us up for all the advantages that we're seeing now. Okay. Um, <clears throat> healthcare, life sciences, education, those are areas that carried us through the Great, Recess the great Recession. And also, um, we, also we took the opportunity and we invested. We passed, we passed bond bills. And at the time, there were projects that were going out for estimates. And because the economy was bad, they were come the, the uh, final bills were better than they would have were been. Were coming in under the estimates. Great. So we were able to do do more with less. Good. So um, so I think that if you really look at that, we were able to take advantage of a lot of opportunities. And maintain a very high standard, <coughs> if I may, in education. Yes, we did. Which is something that's very important. And yeah, we actually, um, I think I was, we were at $3 billion, maybe $2 billion, $2.3 billion uh, when I got elected, I have mm -hmm. to go back and check, to um, Overall, our budget, I think we were $4.3 billion last year for this, for this fiscal year. Okay. Um, yeah, and if you look at, like, Leicester. So we're up again. This, so <coughs> over FY16, it looks like education aid for Leicester for FY17 um, is an increase of about a, almost $100,000. So we're looking at just under $10 million there in education aid. Yep. And then the unrestricted aid, we're looking at another bump up there, uh, a little under hundred. One point seven million. Yeah, yep, but yep. yeah, seventy thousand dollars. So you know the, the, the adjustments are coming. Um, yep. You know as as costs increase. So we're, we're funding these guys um, at a level that's reasonable at yep. this point. Without yeah. you know, um, if you look at again now, you got to put everything. Everyone can someone sit, sit back and say, well, that's not really a lot of money. Mm -hmm. But if you look back statewide on the unrestricted government aid, yep. the UGGA, um, that was one point two billion dollars that the Commonwealth um, allocated for funding. Um, that was an increase of 42 million over last fiscal year. Okay. Uh, as I just said, the overall Chapter 70 yep. funding was 4.63 billion dollars for Chapter 70. That was a 116 million dollar increase over 
fiscal 2016. And then we also did it, we did an initial funding of $55 per pupil for additional aid. So, you know, people sit back and say, well, well it's only, it's only $100,000 more than last year. But you've got to look at everything we're funding, the total, the total package in. Um, and a lot of the funding, uh, you know, sad to say, is we, we should try to figure out some way to do this. A lot of, um, a lot of the funding for our uh, you know, municipal resources ends up falling on the property tax. So <coughs> Very regressive tax. No, it, it is. I mean, <coughs> sorry, I'm reaching for the mic. It's all good. Um, no, it is. But it's, it's finding that alternative funding source. Yeah. Um, it's just you know, it's just like if you look at the the gas tax, that's another example. Here's something that when people say, oh, you know, um, about raising the gas tax a few years ago, you know, where's all the money going? People have to remember that if you look back 20 years ago, 25 years ago, what did the car get per gallon for gas? A, a buck or less. You, well, no, you may have gone what 15 miles to the gallon. Oh, gas now, miles. Right, gas miles. Now you're getting, uh, you can get 25, 30, 40. Even you know the the, the hybrid cards now, yeah. so it's a it's a diminishing return yeah. on the revenue. So there's less money coming in to fund all the infrastructure needs that we that we need, and that's why so you try uh, to put it back to the status quo. Right, just to, even just to maintain it. So um, that money goes into education and funds. Well, the gas tax money does, does it goes into highway projects. Okay, and even the even the transportation bond bill, which, which is a great segue <coughs> for the next point here about the transportation bond bill. Yeah, we did the transportation bond bill, which uh, actually we were able to fund the uh, Washington Street Bridge, which you know I do want to um, thank Representative Benenda because he actually was a uh, it's one of the last things that uh, we were able to um, get for him that I remember we met with the governor's office about trying to get, well, we got, we got it in the bond bill, but I can remember meeting with the governor's office when, you know, he was there and saying, look, this is, when he, know his, he knew his term was coming to an end, yeah. that he made the pitch for, was trying to get the funding for this. And, um, yeah, John Brando was quite a guy, and I've seen you two in a room, yeah. you know, many times, and he always made room for everybody. That was, that was something about John, he was always trying to be fair to everybody, made room for everybody. Anything that you learned from him coming up with him being such, you know, in there for so long? John being in town as a teacher and representing this district for, what, 28, 30 years? 28? You know, uh, yeah, close to, th yeah, 28, maybe. Th I'm not sure if it's 28 or 27 <coughs> or 30. Yeah, it's close. But it's longer than I'll ever be elected to office. Yeah, you know, one thing, you know, everyone talks about, everyone talks um, on a federal base, like federally about Ted Kennedy and, um, um, how he was the great uh, negotiator or compromiser. He could work with both sides. One thing that you knew from John is if you went to, went to him on how to get legislation through or um, really getting people to come together, that you know, it's not, you can't force something through. If you, if you, you can try and you may get success with lim some limited success, but if you want to get the legislation through, you got to bring everyone together, both sides of the table. And John was very good at bringing people together. And, uh, <coughs> He taught a lot to a lot of people as a teacher. I know he always, I think he had my sister and possibly my brother in class. You know, he didn't have me, but I learned a lot from him as well. He's quite an interesting guy. John Bonetta was an institution, to say the least. He was. You know, I can remember John, um, and I was, it was just in awe of someone would come up and he'd say, oh, hey, Mr. Senator, no, okay, this Senator, this is so-and-so. He lived at this address, this voting precinct. He remembered everything about them. I had his kids in school. His, his memory his, his was... His social uh, intelligence was incredibly high. <laughs> it really was, yeah. Um, I always had fun standing and holding signs with him. He was always trying to impart and uh, make room for people, and that's, what I think, what, you know, is important. And, you know, yeah. people talk about Mike Moore, people <laughs> talk about an accessible senator, and uh, I've always found you to be very accessible to anybody, you know, that makes the call. So oh. I remember working in your office, and some of those, you know, drives back here to drop off talk points from, you know, between 4 p.m. be here for 6. You know, they were a little tight, but we got it done. We got it done. Yeah. And, you know, and anyone who calls up my office wants a meeting, I meet with. Yep. So. Um, yeah, no, it's always good. But yeah. that's the Rawson Street Bridge here. You know, oh, yeah, that's, God that's, bless Johnny B. Yeah, so so, so what's, the, what's the plan here? We're, we're planning to move forward here. And um, do you have any idea what the what the current status is? Or just uh, I, know it's, it's, I know it's under um, underway with finalizing the design for the bridge. And I, th I think they were trying to get it done. Um, expedite it to either this, is it this spring or the following spring? Um, it's going to be uh, part of the small bridge, um, small bridge program. So, well, bridges were you know an important <coughs> part of you know infrastructure investment, and this bridge in particular, I'm sure you've been over it, certainly could use the work. So I'm well, glad that we're definitely doing. It, thanks to yourself and, and you know the representative and Rep. Benenda for, yeah, and for the, doing it. Um, 
you know, and obviously we, there was an issue with the funding um, that, that when the administrations changed and they were looking at the funding, um, there was an issue whether the funding was going to be maintained. Um, you know, so Representative Campanelli um, deserves some credit here, and that we all met with uh, Mass DOT Department of Transportation and fought to keep the funding available, um, make sure it wasn't taken away. So, Kay Campanelli in her first term doing some pretty good work there, some pretty heavy lifting, so we yep. appreciate that. And I'm sure she continues to have a good um, you yep. know, relationship okay, between yeah. your, your office and her as representing yep. Lester. And, yeah, no, uh, she's, she's nice to work with. She's yeah. a, you know, a good personality and she's nice. She's, she's, not, she's not there making enemies with people, so, which, is, which is good. Now, it came across <coughs> um, my desk here that obviously we're all aware of this opioid problem <coughs> right now. Uh, the district attorney holding a series of community meetings throughout the district, um, getting people kind of in the know on what's going on. And for me, you know, on my own, you kind of look at the quickness with which uh, opioids and painkillers are prescribed, um, you know, by the pharmaceuticals, by doctors, and there becomes an issue where some of these are very highly addictive where people, um, there, there's our podcast coming in. I think he, may, he might have gone out for that one. Did you go out for that one, Art? And the, God bless. Oh, see, they're taking care of me. You're talking about public service here. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So, so the opioid crisis, I'm fine for right now. Thank you. Um, district attorney early going out and trying to make sure that people are aware. And uh, pharmaceutical companies certainly having an, uh, a profitable year. Um, in any case, it trickles down and, you know, maybe people can't quite get off of the uh, painkillers <coughs> or whatever the reason is. There seems to be um, a real problem here. And um, the new... Um, card in the game, I guess you could say, is, is fentanyl, which I guess is a, is a synthetic type of opioid yeah. where it, it's, it's incredibly uh, potent and just a few, I don't know, granules could end up being fatal um, yeah. to multiple people. Yeah. So, I mean, um, this is a pretty big issue, Mike, and um, what do we think we're going to, uh, you guys are working on some legislation here. Can you tell us a little bit about what's going well, on there? We actually, um, there's at the beginning of the last legislative session, um, they should go back to the previous session. Okay. Um, do you remember when Chandler Jones with the Patriots right before the Super Bowl? I'm sorry. Um, it showed up at the, one of the police stations and have, was having a psychotic event. Okay. Um, he had actually taken um, synthetic marijuana. Okay. And going back, I think it was four years, four years ago, um, we had received contact from contact from some some people that there was synthetic synthetic actually Billy Bro from from, um, from Maine South, South yeah. Alliance had he had reached out to myself and Representative Benenda about there were some of these um, retail gas stations that were selling what's it called Spice K two it's like an incense that is, that that was being used as synthetic marijuana so right around that time we did some research and found out down on the South Shore some kids had um overdosed <coughs> on the synthetic marijuana. So we worked on some legislation, and about four years ago I was able to get the synthetic marijuana um, banned. And then right after around that time, after we get that into play, the legislation plas passed. Mm -hmm. We started, just started hearing about synthetic heroin becoming an issue. So we then filed, we then filed, a, um, actually when we did the synthetic marijuana, um, the reason we had to do that because the federal definition of it as a class one substance didn't meet it. And at that point, my office found out that we had these other drugs that didn't, because the chemical components it were didn't changing, fit the description. it didn't fit the description. So what I think if I remember correctly, when they were, they were changing the, uh, the makeup of the spice, the synthetic marijuana, to is evade the legislation that was being passed by certain states in order to bring that under um, an unlisted substance. Under that right, category. so basically, yeah, what they would do was say, say the chemical components were A, B, C, and D. They would, that was in the statute. <laughs> they, they would make something, a synthetic drug that was the chemical component consistency of it was A, B, C, and G. Yep. So it didn't fit the criteria. And they just the, keep playing that shell They game. keep playing right. So we, we tell the legislation to what they call with, they call a synthetic drug, which was the marijuana. So we had to use the same format for synthetic heroin. So right around, so when we found out that there wasn't anything for an opioid or heroin, we filed legislation. And, um, and last year, we were able to get it passed. And basically what it does is um, it, 
It covers the fentanyl, um, which is five to 15 times more potential, uh, potent than heroin, if you can imagine that, and the problems we have with heroin. It's a, it's a synthetic substance with no recognized medical use and is often labeled as not for human consumption. And that, again, that's to avoid government regulation. The substance sits in a legal, well, it sat in a legal gray area while it qualifies as an analog of fentanyl. A large quantity of acetone, acetone fentanyl may not be regulated if it is labeled as a product for non-human uses. So what they're doing is escaping regulation by saying, hey, this isn't for human consumption, when it's right. just a smoke and mirror show, yeah. if you will. Yeah. Um, and this causes, it causes overdoses and deaths. Um, so this, is a, this has been in the headlines quite a bit lately. So it looks like you guys were a little bit ahead of the curve on this one. Yeah, actually, no. Um, if this, was, this was last year's session that you guys yeah, had worked uh, on this um, one. I will say luckily, and I don't, know if it's, I don't know if it's luckily or not, but I think, again, back to what you said um, about being accessible, um, a lot of these, like the synthetic marijuana, we were a little head ahead of the curve on that. And um, the synthetic heroin, I think we were ahead of the curve basically because we were accessible and what people met with my office. Correct. People's ears were to the ground and they passed that information to you. Right. And what I found to be interesting sometimes is people get mad about issues, maybe, you know, with the state government, and <laughs> they had never alerted the state government about that issue. So, like, yeah. those are, you know, cause, trying to cause conflict. But, you know, Billy Bro came to you, a guy who's been working with certain populations in that area for a long time. And, um, you know, the, the process does work if people are communicating. Yeah. Well, and people are communicating, and the people you're communicating to will actually follow through for you. So, so it's a, a multi-pronged yeah, multi -prong process. Actually, you know, I can, uh, I can say and take the credit and say, yeah, we were very proactive on this. And maybe we were, but we were only able to be proactive because I had constituents or I had people that come to me with issues and then, then my staff and everyone were able to work it forward and say, okay, yeah, there is an issue here that we have to address. Well, you appreciate it. No, oh, no, thanks. I mean, yeah. it's, it's really, you know, people, it's something I always talk to people too about, you know, a lot of times people get upset with the fact that um, they may, I may not be in the office, I may be out here in the district meeting with someone or vice versa, I'm in the office and I can't meet there and they're meeting with staff. People got to remember is that there's going to be over 5,000 pieces of legislation filed. I'm going to have close. I'm going to be having filing close. I think 90. That's a lot. But how many? That's, other but that, that's that's almost um, 20 times what it was when we started. Yeah, I think yeah. I had maybe 20. <laughs> yeah. So, um, <clears throat> but you got to remember that there are so many different issues, and you can't obviously. I got eight, I got eight communities. I committee. I got communities I have to hear. So what's your? What's your? Is it 240,000 people? Is that who you represent? 100, 171,000. They could change the district. Yeah. It was 171? Yeah, it was closer to one. It was, I think it was like 167 oh, yeah, 160. before the last redistricting. Yeah. But then um, re re redistricting, you know, state senator is supposed to be about 165,000. Okay. Plus or minus 5%. Uh, and I am roughly at like 4.8%. Well, so your big district? Yeah, so I'm just under the... the well, it's a large the, geographic uh, district, too. You know, from Leicester to Upton. It's yeah. a little bit of a haul from corner yeah, to corner. So you've got Leicester, Millbury, Auburn, Grafton, Shrewsbury. Upton, half of Northbridge, and then um, like the southern 40% of the city of Worcester. Here's the real question. How many rebounds do you average in per game up here at the Gloucester Town Hall? You know, I've only been able to make one game so far. Okay, well, and there I may have been some scheduling problems, Paul well, Davis. Yeah, yeah. Paul Davis. I'm not throwing Paul under the bus. That's all right. I'm not throwing Paul under the bus either, but I think that, uh, you know, there's an issue there. Bob pinched and alerted me to that, so he told me to stay on top of Paul. And that's what I'm going to do. Bob pinched a great guy. Great guy. This is. So um, working on that fentanyl issue, keeping your ear to the ground. Um, you know, I remember meeting with, uh, with one of your first terms there, um, meeting with you when I worked for your office with John Oliver on behalf of the teachers union, who used to be the sixth grade science teacher up here. And I found John Oliver to be a very serious, serious teacher. And a lot of people did, too. But to come to find out, you know, just a regular guy puts his pants on. And I remember sitting in there, and they wanted the team to talk about cola increases that year. And that was the recession hit. We just talked yes. about this. Yeah. And you sat there, and you looked him in your face just like this. You're like, do you want the real answer? And he's like, yeah. And you gave him the real, <laughs> the real answer. Things went forward the way they were supposed to go forward. Yep. And it was what it was. But that's, you know, he approaches you. You give him a real answer. There's people that have come to you about certain things, maybe about pensions, maybe about this and that. And, you know, that's what, you know, my buddy Bob Pissy he says the cleanest one in the business right here, Mike Moore. And we appreciate what you do, Mike. It's not easy. It's not an easy job. People are out there to cause problems for their own benefit sometimes. And, you know, sometimes people don't see the forest through the trees. But uh, we appreciate that you do. Oh, and, uh, nice. you know, thanks for always being accessible, coming down to, to Lester LCAC Studios with us. And, oh, it's my you know, pleasure. You know, well, actually, this is the, this is the um, 
some of the best parts being we have to get the feedback and talk to people. Yeah. I mean, if you sit up in your office and you don't you don't interact with anyone, how are you really going to represent them? Or right. know what issues you should push? Well, and like you said, you listen and you, you got to listen and follow through. Not every idea is merit. I remember one phone call that I received, and God bless the constituent. But it was you know I was generous with my time that day. But it was a long time about how special education money for her child should be going directly to her bank account. So now. You know, I'm not sure if that's necessarily going to be a viable issue. I'm not asking you to weigh in on that. It's my own opinion. However, um, you know, there's, it takes all types. And when you're in your situation, there's a lot of people coming at you. There's a lot of sides. You have to make the best decision on the best interest of the district. One of those, you know, helped out. And uh, we're getting that Rosson Street Bridge going. So that's, that's good. Okay. And uh, increases in funding here statewide and in our districts. So that's good. Um, you know, there's always room for improvement. But you, you're working hard, man. So we appreciate that. Well, thanks. Thank what, you. What else have you been working on? Anything, anything good that, you know, you want to bring up? As far well, as yeah, you get some legislation here, we we talked about the uh, we talked about synthetic synthetic reform bill. Yeah, okay. Um, and, and it, um, again, coming from the local government, yep. there's one piece that we did last year that um, an act relative to housing and redevelopment authority vacancies. But actually, what this does, it affects it goes be, um, um, beyond just the one city or town that uh, came to with this. This there's over 700 boards of commissions that the governor's office has the authority to make that has at least one representative where they make appointments to that board. Mm -hmm. um, it's a lot of power. A lot of power, and but it's also, it's also a lot to keep track of. So you had, you, we, we had some cities and towns that were going without their gubernatorial appointments. So they literally, they could not make votes or they could not move forward huh. because <clears throat> they couldn't fill, they, could, they had to wait for the governor to fill this off with these appointments and they weren't being filled. So we were, we were able to get legislation passed that um, it's now pursuant to Section 5 of Chapter 121B. The local housing and redevelopment boards are comprised of five members, four members elected by the town, uh, uh, comprised of five members from, or by the city, by the mayor of the city, yep. and one member, appointed by the, one member appointed by the Department of Housing and Community Development. In districts, the positions appointed by the state on both these boards have remained vacant for extended period of time. Uh, the vacancy may be more difficult to fill, but uh, it's, it's let, if the um, if it's not filled within 120 days, it falls upon the the city or town can then make the appointment. So now you can do Good. it. You, it throws the authority into it certain say throws it. If you have a board, as you well know, quorum's important. If you can't get yep. a quorum, and if that person's supposed to be you know part yep. of that, then if they're not showing up or if they're not even being appointed, yep. that's not streamlined government. And we're trying to work for an efficient government. And you know, when you look at a, uh, housing and community development. We were just talking about this. One of the big issues we're facing is the lack of housing, whether it's public public housing or it's just affordable housing. And if I may, Mike, we had a discussion, and again, my opinion, not the selectman's opinion, just always want to make sure that that's clear. We had a discussion about how the master plan in town is kind of set up to, you know, um, uh, not prohibit, but um, inhibit any type of uh, growth. And when I was looking for an apartment in town, I found it incredibly difficult to locate an apartment that was reasonably priced, that was a one bedroom apartment. It was very slim pickings. And it can be difficult to find places, but, you know, it's good to see that, you know, that the legislature's paying attention and the checks and balances are kind of working here, where we're looking at the executive office and we're saying, hey, listen, we could be doing a little bit better. And you guys take and pick up the slack there. So that's good news. Yeah. And again, this was this, again, this was, this was an issue that one of the um, the boards, one of my towns, came forward. He said, "Look, we've got this vacancy. We can't do anything. We need it." So, and you know, we we actually called the governor's office, and in, in to respect to this governor, this was the previous governor, Duval. Duval. We called him his office, not him personally, his office, several times, and the local board was putting a name forward. And we were trying to advocate for that. And they just never made the appointment. No effort, huh? Yeah. So it was finally at that point. So as well. Maybe he was running for president at that point. Yeah. Well, that never materialized. Yeah, I know. So. But they get those search committees going out. Yeah. You never know. Anyways, uh, yeah, all, yeah. I'm a big fan myself. You know, maybe maybe not other everyone else, but I think they did a great job when he was but in office. Nice to do a good job. Um, the other big thing we did is um, we also did a title clearing bill. What does that mean? Well, as an attorney, I have a good idea. But for the people at home, what do we have to do about that? And this is not the subprime. This has to do with after the subprime mortgage crisis in moving out in the late, um, late middle 90s, late 90s, um, you had people who had bought foreclosed properties. Now, what happened was after they bought them, they bought them in good faith. Bonafide purchaser Bona for value. Purchaser, good faith. Now, put yourself in this situation where here you are, 
Mrs. Mr. and Mrs. Smith go off to buy a house. Right. They buy the house. They buy the house. They think they're free and clear. They have some kids. Don't they're have ten kids. years in. They're ten years in. Whatever. And all of a sudden, uh, <clears throat> out of the blue, someone comes back and says that, well, first, you buy the house, and there's all this happens, and then someone takes a case to court. In the court in the Ibanez. Ibanez. Ibanez case. Well, I always mispronounce that. That's all right. The, the, the uh, case goes to court, and the court rules that basically, this is, it, I think people remember when the, they, the banks were accused of just rubber stamping all the paperwork. Robo signing, they call Ro it. Robo signing. Now, and so people at home, they probably are aware, most people, you know, the homeowners, anyways, that they have to actually have all their ducks in a row. They have to have the note. They have to, in order to collect these mortgages and make these, these titles clear. Now, I'm going to make something, cl clarify something. The foreclosures, the people that were being foreclosed on weren't paying their mortgages. So they weren't able to keep their financial commitment. Where the banks made the mistake was the processing of the paperwork. So these weren't illegal mortgages or the subprime loan issues, the predatory lending that was taking place. It was, it was possibly somehow intertwined because of the vast nature of how they pushed all these things through so fast. It was that, that, it was that time and era where it wasn't the actual mortgage-backed securities that you're dealing with, but you are dealing with the quickness and the vastness of these large numbers of mortgages that are being but signed, it, titles that are being signed it, off on. But it wasn't more, it wasn't more the predatory of just skinning people to take out the mortgages and just right. knowing they can't pay them back. Right. So basically, so the scenario was, once this case went forward, you had people who bought house, homes in good faith that now the titles were what they called cloudy. They weren't clear titles because now because of the, the, these, um, of this robo case and the determination by the court that the foreclosures weren't valid yep. foreclosures, you had people who had made life investments in properties that didn't, they, they couldn't refinance the home. So if you were, say you had a son or daughter, you wanted to take refinance so that you could pay for their college tuition, you couldn't do that, you couldn't sell, you couldn't do anything with the property because it wasn't clear title to it. And Again, this came... That's where title insurance comes in very big, and so but uh, this came, I want to make sure you're free and clear. There was over, there was a range of from 30,000 to 100,000 people across the state that this, this, this probably could have affected. Uh, so and that also led to housing courts gaining jurisdiction over some of these things because there was such a backlog in the land courts, they had to push these things through, and there was such a nexus between the eviction process and the foreclosure process that it actually, the housing court, which is recently a new court, and it's kind of like... It's not, it's not a lesser court, but it's just it's a, it's a very specific court. Yeah. So you got the housing courts judges that are in there making you know, very, very important determinations. A lot of that case law was, was melded right there in Worcester Housing Court, uh, Boston Municipal. Yeah. So it's very interesting that you know, it's very good to see you know, the legislature and a legislator, our legislator, on top of the cutting edge of you know, foreclosure law, uh, case law, well, because I don't, I'm not sure every legislator is well, going to have knowledge of the case law that's governing the law at this time. Well, and again, you know, and again, coming from, if you look at my background with criminal justice and, and um, the environmental and all that, um, <clears throat> again, we had someone come to us. I was actually out door knocking, and someone brought this issue. Then we had someone approach us at the state house and said, look, this, this is the title issue. You've got people in your district who have these cases where, and again, as we, as we were setting up before, picture now being, before this was passed, owning that property for 10 years, 15 years, and then someone out of the past <coughs> who couldn't meet the financial obligations at that time, coming back and saying, wait a minute, I want my house back. And now they could be in a better financial situation where they try to, they take the house. Well, what was interesting to me about this whole thing, and you know, in my <coughs> history, <coughs> looks like that was contagious, that cough. <coughs> the, uh, going back, uh, the, the, the banks are at common law supposed to do a kind of a workout with these guys to try to, if they can't pay it, to try to do something. In a lot of those cases, okay, we know that the people couldn't pay it. They were sometimes, you know, you know lended, you know, uh, maybe something they knew they couldn't pay back. But they're supposed to try to do some kind of a workout. Their mortgage is 1800 bucks a month, and they can swing 1500 they're supposed to try to do some kind of a refinance, but that wasn't happening. They actually had to go ahead and try to codify that again in case law, well, in case law, um, to restate the rule that already exists. And you find this happens sometimes with law. Um, but, you know, we appreciate people standing up to the big banks, and we also appreciate the banks getting, you know, what they're supposed to get in business. For people, if they're being deadbeats, obviously they don't get to stay in their house. Yeah. So it, it's very well taken, I think, to, especially to homeowners who pay their bills regularly, to have somebody, a blast from the past, Ghostbusters style, come back that couldn't make the monthly payment 
it in the first place and uh, was foreclosed on owing a substantial sum. But that definitely doesn't encompass every single case. No, it doesn't. And you know, in the opponents of this were that we are, we are allowing uh, people who got defrauded from their property, the, the banks took their properties illegally away. It really, it really, it really wasn't taken illegally. Um, that we were taking away their rights to getting back their property. So what this what this bill did, if you for people are familiar with criminal law and there's a statute of limitations, it basically established a three year statute of limitations. That if you feel you were, if you were a victim of this, you have three years to file a court action. Now, if you are someone who's already feels you've been a victim, you had a hunt, you had one year, in addition to that three years when this was first passed. So you were actually given four years. Which is, which is a fair amount of time considering California has some really weird laws. Massachusetts has very strict eviction laws, but California doesn't. But the right of redemption, whatever, you have a right to go back and cure your mortgage in some instances, and it varies from state to state because states set property law, not the federal government, whatever. Yeah. The right of redemption of four years in California is a very sore issue for a lot of people because you know, after a four-year period, you can come back and pay off you know, what was owed. Um, right. Very yeah. interesting stuff, how these laws work and how they're quirky from state to state. So you guys kind of have... Maybe look at other states and what they're doing. Uh, oh, you and, and, the process. And, and we did. And actually, one one thing about this legislation, a lot of times it's tough to get legislation through the legislature into the governor's decks. We actually we did this twice. This actually did Patrick's last term. We got this through, and he made it right at the end of the session. He um, he wouldn't sign it. He sent it back with an amendment to make the three-year statute at ten years. So we're like, well, wait a minute. How does that, that how does that benefit anyone? It just guts the it just guts it completely. It, it, it got, right. So we didn't we didn't support it. <clears throat> so we had to get we had to do it again. And amazingly, I was. Uh, was it a veto, or did you guys bring a different piece of legislation? No, it, di it, it died because he said he sent it back. It wasn't a veto. He sent yep. it back with a recommended amendment, and the amendment was changed the three years to ten years. And then we would have to, the House and the Senate would then have to vote to codify it, which we, which we didn't do. <clears throat> so we, when this session, the previous session started, we filed it. And surprisingly, uh, within the first few months of the session, the uh, judiciary released the bill from committee favorably, and we, would get, we were able to get this bill passed. Now, that was it, that go, did that go to Duval or did that go to? No, it's going to Baker. To Charlie. And he, and he signed off it. Because he, well, he's going to prefer th 3 to 10. Well, <clears throat> what, it, what it does do now, in opposition to the opponents of the bill, what it does still allow is that if you say after you exceed the four years, or these people, the three years, or the individuals right now who feel they've been violated and they haven't been able to get back the house, they can still file a 93A claim and get back trouble damages. Greatest law, greatest law. But you, you just can't get the house back. So you now you've got that So you can recover your damages, but you can't be put back into the house because life goes on and time goes on. You can't, and you know, and you the Joneses have moved into the Smiths right. and they and you Bobby and you now. And you don't dislocate a family that may be in there now. Bonafide purchaser for value, which makes their title good. It should make their title good right. as soon as that comes, but there was such a, a grand scale that the judiciary and the legislature had to take yeah. action. So, it, you know, it worked out well. I think that's, this, was, um, this was one of those surprising pieces that when it came in, we didn't realize how big, but as once it got the hearings going, and the numbers started hearing how many people affected across the state, it was like, oh my God, this, this thing really ended up blowing up. And it became a, it really became a big issue. Yeah, but it's good, though. I mean, and, you know, I'm in the housing law business, and um, you know, it's a relatively new area of law, consumer protection, Chapter 93A. But as you know, the, the, the market is what it is at this time for people of lower than, lower than upper socioeconomic status, renting in warranties and conditions, it's a really serious issue. It, as it goes forward, it's going to be a more serious issue. Um, you know, and a lot of that law has been left to the judiciary to put forward, but I mean, obviously the Chapter 93A and, and all those regulations, wonderful stuff, and it does benefit people. I get a lot of gripes about how it's not fair, but before those laws existed, the reason those laws came, <coughs> people have a problem with regulations sometimes, I get why, because you want to, you're feeling constricted, um, but those, you know, we all started off living in the wilderness, and we had civilization, and we made these, they, they didn't exist, and then we're going to take them away. We make these laws because 
something needs to happen. We try to address these problems, these issues. Sometimes yeah. there's knee-jerk politics, like, you know, ATV well, stuff, but yeah. one of those ATV bills I got a bone to pick with <laughs> the last 10 years. But, um, you know, that well, being what it is, well, like, in, 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 we got to address these issues. Well, you, you basically, in the world, like I always say to someone, that, you know, when they complain about regulations, a regulation is there because someone was impacted negatively, and that's what resulted in the results in regulations. Now, no one likes it, or no one wants a new law passed unless they're the victim of something. Then they're calling, this should be a state law, and this is what happened. So that's usually how, we, um, how I've seen things. And sometimes it's a gray area that hasn't what been is? addressed, you know, and in this area, you know, with, that, with the, the Ibanez and the Iqbal cases and the foreclosure law. I mean, again, there was something at common law that should have dealt with this, but, you know, their banks were going to do their own thing, the people were going to do their own thing, and, you know, we need to, you know, clarify some of the steps. And and this is where, if we didn't, jump in the middle sometimes. You know, you'd have these, you'd just, think, just think, you're at 100,000, just think of the housing market and the, the houses that are remained, think of your neighborhood and you've got a house that's remained empty for the last eight years or 10 years or five years. The grass is overgrown. It's getting in worse shape. There's one on the corner of 56 in Stafford. Well, all right, well just think about that now. If, if, if it's because of the title issue, <laughs> well, it, that's affecting the property value around so there. So you guys can alleviate that and make so it this help, right, this, So this ends up helping the housing market in general. It also helps the, both parties. The party, because you can still do 93A if you've been a victim, and the person, that, the person who did end up buying it in good faith breathe some relief. gets to breathe some relief. Yeah. So, so you guys have busted it up there. I mean, you're doing a good job, I think. Oh, well, we don't it's not easy to go up there. You, so if people want to say this and that, go sit up in that office and see how you make out for a day. Well, I couldn't do your job. I, you know, I, I run around. I'm a lawyer. I, I'm in select minute. I could not. 16 hours a day, every day, minimum. Good night. Good, th good luck. Thank you. <laughs> Enjoy. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Enjoy that. Um, well, what I want to bring up here, and this is something you did um, with uh, you joint sponsored with Representative Frost from Auburn, an act relative to grave markers to commemorate the grave of a veteran police officer or a firefighter here. We're on page six. Okay. Yeah. And um, so it was that prohibits the unauthorized sale of veterans grave markers in Massachusetts. Yeah. That's, um, that's something that's very, very, you know, amicable. I mean, um, we appreciate, you know, your efforts on behalf of veterans. I know you're, there, you're friendly with Bill Moore. That, you know, yeah. He does a lot with the veterans. But, um, you know, so what's going on with uh, what's up with that bill? Well, that bill, came, again, came as a result of someone calling the office. We had someone from Auburn, a veteran, who called the office and said, look, we got an issue with... Great mark is well, I have no idea what this is. I'm not. I'm a civvy. I'm a civvy through and through. I apologize to the non-civvies. Thank you for your service. What are we talking about here? Great mark is iron, metal. There's some value they're to it. They're taking it for scrap. So they take it for scrap. That's you terrible. Can, yeah. So they take it, and there was there was no law against it. So um, again, again, this came where um, this is why. Look at people. Don't be afraid to call the office. You should, whether it's my office, and I'm sorry, Kate, call Kate's yeah, office. Kate wants to feel, hear from me, too. Feel, feel, feel free, totally because some of office. the best legislative ideas or initiatives we can get come from people who are paying attention or... I agree. Have, I, don't, I hate to say I've been a victim, but I've been a victim or have, have, have had some interaction where there's... Like in town, we have this issue with parks, and I'm working on a parks issue here, and it came, I was knocking doors on my one and only race here, and uh, Mike Saunders, always very active in the community, his son Andy has been very vocal on this issue, um, but Mike and his wife Becky mentioned, hey, listen, we have to go to, uh, we have to go to McDonald's Play Place to bring our kids someplace to play during school hours, because the only play place we have is really that one that's an annex, which was raised with private, pri private money uh, on the side of the primary school. So, um, you, know, you know, me being, I don't have kids, but I see what the, what the benefit is of when we were, uh, when you were, when we, when you were in your first term, we did something over at Banus Park, which was, um, you remember, you were there, um, a few other electives were there, and it was Kaboom is this company that does oh. like, renovations and stuff like that. They partnered up with Home Depot, and Banus Park, which is like a little tiny park, similar to Totade. So b based on my experience with your office and seeing that, I'm going to try to, you know, do something along that line on my own, not asking you for anything. But, um with Parks and Rec and see if I can get something going from a grant standpoint. Um, but again, you know, that's something but see, that... But see, that's something like even <coughs> um, as in this, 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 I guess, ties into the whole water issue where there's, you know, we did two years ago, we did, a, we did five bond bills. And something like that could tie into the environmental bond bill. So having, getting notified of that, so that when the, if we start doing the bond bill again, mm -hmm. That's something that... So, like, hypothetically, I'm not going here. I'm not going here, Mike. 
I'm not going here. But say hypothetically, if there was a water thing and you were shovel ready, you know, you could try to get on one of those bond bills if the delegation's aware of what's going on and the town's got its ducks in a row. Yes. So, but it, it have to have a ducks in a row application process, permitting process. Right. The, the, the project is whatever it is, whether it's a park right. or if it's a street. Well, even like the park, if you've got, if you because ways and means, contrary to what people believe, ways and means when we put forward these initiatives, they they want to see the project. How do you know this is the cost? Because um, if they're going to fund it, then they fund it. Now, the way a bond bond bill works is, you'll see us pass. Say there's a, a billion dollar bond bill. We may pass a bond bill that contains $3 billion worth of projects. That's because not every one of those projects goes forward. And say during the process, as Mike was saying, if, if, it, if say the administration is going to approve a project, but some, for some reason it doesn't go forward, there's a backup project that the funding can be used to, to fund. So there's ex extra projects. But You've got to, we, we've got to get, we've got to show ways and means, yep. the documentation. That this is like a legitimate thing, so we're not just thing, making right. up ideas and saying, let's so get like, some checks in. So right. now, th I think the life of the environmental bond bill is a five-year bond. Okay. So we did it two years ago, so we got maybe two and a half to three years before it, it expires. So if we do another environmental bond bill, knowing if the town's got a plan in place. For whatever the project may be, streets. Right, sidewalks, yeah. whatever. Well, that's, you know, the streets would come under transportation. There's different categories of bonds. Yep. So what, if we got a bond bill coming, coming up that may address that, and it could be from the water infrastructure. Whatever it happens to be. <laughs> not, I told you, I'm not going there. I'm, oh, no, I'm just saying. But this is where there's got to be some investment from the town point. It's like the city of Worcester. We, did, um, we were able to get a $20 million project. Yep. Um, and I can remember going to a, a meeting uh, I first got elected, <coughs> and I had a, a formal rep up there saying, this project will never get done. The state's never going to have the money for it. Uh, we were able to get the funding in the bond bill. The city of Worcester came up with 10. The, we came up with 10. So the city matched it. So we, we split the costs, and now you know, along Route 20 from um, Pub 99 to the Upper Blackstone, all the water, and the, the, excuse me, the sewer is all being replaced. You wouldn't, the system currently has the sewer from Route 20, the whole section of Route 20, going up by Lake Ave. Uh, there's two pumping stations. One goes up by Lake Ave, up the UMass Hospital, so it goes through the city. Yeah. Oh, and the, the direction they send it, instead of sending it a mile, direct, direct mile route to the upper Blackstone. Six Blackstone. miles around? Yeah. Um, so it's, <laughs> and you know, you have these 100 year storms. This is why you hear Lake Quinsig, you hear a lot of times the septic overflowing, because the septic from that area is, isn't just from the houses in the area along, along the lake. It's coming from Route 20. Uh, and this actually, this is actually a benefit to They close those, that beach sometimes, I, I walk and run down there, so, yeah. you know. And this is actually a benefit to the town of Shoes, because shoesby has got issues with their water capacity and s some sewer capacity issues. So, where it's gonna it's gonna bring new piping in. This could this could allow future access to Shrewsbury to the Upper Blackstone. No, no, um, that's, yeah, that's actually, very it's more, more important. Infrastructure, about it. infrastructure for water, you know, is important in many towns and communities. It's starting to come up. And I remember, if you remember Dorchester Street a couple of years ago, when that when the entire street became rippled yeah. because the water mine burst. There's there's some yeah. old infrastructure in the city of Worcester. So, you know, I'm sure you're not seeing it just. You know, here on Patterson oh, Street. Oh, listen, there's going to be um, a lot of infrastructure um, issues. Um, but before I forget, um, yeah. the, the other thing with the infrastructure, with, with one of the um, other reasons besides the, the environmental um, bond bill, we were able to, to get money from the um, transportation. But a lot of our argument was the protecting the environment, but also economic development. Because the existing sewage that was on Route 20 didn't have the capacity to to handle large industrial or uh, business complexes. So, for an economic development perspective. So, economic development. It, now, this now makes this whole property, all the properties on that, more, more viable. viable. And if you look at the location between two mass pike entrances, you talk about what, what's a what in theory, what's a better location now for a business to come? They can get um, property right along the state highway. That's very good. Um, to, to make it business friendly, and going back to just tie this all in real quick, when we talk about these projects. Um, when we could talk about, say, the park that I'm talking about, it, it makes it a more livable town. There seems there's a sneaky foreclosure problem in Leicester, and there's a sneaky services problem with some of these 
part of the town has problems with water that are pretty bad. <coughs> um, and there's some issues with trying to make this a more livable town. And I think that doing something on a larger scale, not just doing a fresh coat of paint, what's already there down at Totade. I know other people have been working on Burn Coat Park for over 10 years. Yep. Um, you know, there's, there's a need for that. And I think a dog park, walking track, and something that's good for families and that draws people and draws people that you want and draws people that are going to come spend money, they'll come down to Ellis, you know, when they're passing through, rather than, you know, I got Mike Saunders, who's got to go to McDonald's, so our town money, the people that spend their money, they're going to Spencer, they're going to Elm Park, they're going to Rocketland, yep. and instead of drawing people in here, there's no dog park in Worcester. I know in Wisteria, they're talking about this in Worcester Magazine now. Yep. Th there's a need for this, um, and dog parks are a thing. If you walk down Tote, you go down Tote um, Street, which is, you know, right down here in the valley, people are walking their dogs, and that's just a little neighborhood, and it's a younger generation that's in there now. It's, it's not the older generation. There are some older folks down there, but pe if you put in a nice <coughs> park like that, you know, that's going to increase their values. And, you know, the problem has been lack of security, so that's the first thing you have to hit. People don't want riffraff, you know, after a certain hour. But, again, the type of park you build, um, I know if we can, f you played handball down um, down off of Camp Street yeah. there. If you can figure it down down there, if you're off Canterbury Street, you've got to be able to figure it out in Cherry Valley. And I know Chief Hurley's dedicated to this town, and he'll do, you know, do whatever's <coughs> to make it a livable town. So, and you know, it, it, you know the, what makes the Investment things, matters. And, and, and I was going to say, what it makes it easier for us is if, if when I sit down with the leadership or Senate Ways and Means, and I don't know, hopefully Kate would agree, the representative Camp Day would agree to this, that uh, when we can go in and we can show that Ways and Means, look, here's the document, this is what this, the city of town has done, their investment in it, then it's not the city of town, come, someone coming and looking for a handout. Mm -hmm. It's, look, we support this, we support it enough where we've made this investment. And that's the exact reason that I'm going about it in the manner that I am, because the people in town are stretched pretty, right, pretty yep. thin right now. The people just now this water issue in town. We're, we're trying to stay away from it, but there was a 20, a 20 day bill that went out in December. And now people got the real bill, and now there's a, people have been calling my phone. People have been on the internet. There's a lot of uproar about this. Um, you know, people are stretched very thin, and so in order for me to say, hey, listen, we need to build a park and go this, people are going to be like, yeah, Mike, we'd love to, but you know, parks and records eight thousand dollars a year for all the parks together, maintenance included. And again, I think just a rake up and a, a coat of paint isn't going to be enough. I think we have to do something real, and um, I'm going to try to reach out. And again, it's a dead issue right now. So, um, but again, if we can show that we've made effort, and even if say Kaboom isn't going to look at Totade as a pocket park like they did Banus Park, if we can talk to our local community in a serious, concerted effort and do this for real, I think it's something that's easily done. And if you're looking at, and I talked to a guy um, that you know very well in Auburn, and he runs a daycare center, and I asked him outright before I took a first step on this, what's it going to cost to get something like this done? And he's, you know, you got to be concerned about the maintenance. People forget about there's going to be an annual maintenance cost. There's going to be yep. you know, the, the rules and regs that you have to follow to make it a safe place for kids. But again, I think the return on investment, especially if we can get people to chip in um, and do this, if we can get grant funding, that'd be great. State funding, God bless, but you know there's other issues that need to be addressed there right now. So, um, but again, investment. See, again, with, with state funding also comes state requirements. Yeah. So, <coughs> uh, and it, if, if state grants, then they, then you have to meet all the financial requirements. You've got filing requirements. They want documentation. So this nope. is where the oversight comes in. Absolutely, pardon me, <laughs> but um, you know, in the interest. Again, that's why we're doing it this way. Just trying to do it on the private side, and uh, but we do appreciate you know. Everything that's going on, um, transportation you know, funding, etc. Well, you know, another, another thing I was thinking as you were saying this, when we talked about investment, and this um, goes back several years again with uh, Representative Benenda. Um, you guys, this the town, then the credit of the voters and the taxpayers and the fire department for all their work and the, the doing it, but. Um, I think I, I wasn't even in office my first term. Maybe going. To I remember you weren't in <coughs> office about two months, and you had a quite a meeting that you had to sit through. I remember John Benenda <coughs> yelling and walking out of that meeting. But that was a very. <coughs> I don't know if that's the meeting you're talking about. Well, no, this has to do. Well, I don't know if that was part of it. That was an interesting meeting. This now. had to do with John uh, Robinson Benender and I toured the old fire station. Now this is when you guys did the funding for the study. Yeah, yeah that's and, right. Uh, you know, because there was so much um, effort being put into it, uh, we were able to get fifty thousand. Uh, to have a um, study on a location, look at one for the fire, st fire station. Granted, that's a small amount to um, what was eventually, what the voters eventually agreed to paying. But that's the type of thing that the, legis and the legislature has never funded the building of a police or fire station. So to get the... So to ask for that seems a little erroneous. No, yeah. no, it's, it's saying it's, I mean, that's the, where the legislature is looking, okay, we'll give you the seed money here. Okay. But 
now it's, it's a local it's, issue. Now it's a local issue for the town. We're, we're helping you with the, the seed money to look, find out where you want to put it or, or, the, or the direction you want to go in. But now it's, a, it's upon town. Now this is your portion. And it's a lot, you know, it's like, it's like the schools. When you have an MSBA, there it's the other way around. The state's picking up 50, up to 56% of the costs in the community. The, the community's only going to pick up uh, 44%. So depending on it, so again, there's local buy-in. It's it's a it's a cost sharing. <coughs> well, the state organizationally is you know the, the municipality is an extension of the state, and people seem to forget, and I've brought this up, that state money is still taxpayer money. It's still your money is not free money that comes down from the mountainside. I think some people forget about that sometimes. Yeah, and also too is it, the state money is also it's it's um, accessing taxes um, collected from taxpayers from outside of the community. So it's again, it's it's we're a commonwealth. So this is what you know, part of a commonwealth. It's everyone in the state pitching in and trying to work for the betterment of. of and the again, you know, state. you know, this being not in your purview, but <coughs> talking about a lot of people have a problem with the location of the fire station. A lot of people have a problem with the fire station. Not not putting this on you, but just for this. The statement of it that you know it is a local issue that people voted, the people who showed up and voted made the decision, and you know and that's what well, the that's decision was, see. and that's where we are. So you know there's certain stuff that comes up when I'm voting, you know, on the stuff where they've pared it down and they want to add stuff back in, and I'm looking at people wonder, Mike, why are you voting against the fire station? Why are you voting against two hundred thousand dollars for a training tower? It's like, well, we've spent all this money, and we could probably get by without the training tower in the interim when we don't have a park in town, <laughs> we don't have a lot of stuff in town. So we've approved this money. It doesn't mean I don't, you know. When I vote that way, I don't think we have to spend every last penny just because it was approved. Right. So when people have questions about, you know, what's Mike Shivik doing about voting against the fire station, I think it's good to to show people that, you know, that money could, you know, be used somewhere else. You know, there's there's people um, when I was on the personnel board in town, you know, wages have notoriously been lower than comparable towns in town, and there's always been fights here and there. And um, you know, the recession hit the town pretty hard, so um, you know, just trying to fight back up from there. But you know, that you know, being what it is. And this, you know, they would remember too is that. It's a, it's, there's never a shortage of projects or communities with projects that need funding. So at best, <coughs> so if you got that pool of people that are going to be there, you got to be, a, you got to be in that pool and you got to be presentable in that pool. Yeah. So just going around and ringing the bell doesn't get you there. No, you got to be would, doing some work and I, there's a, actually, Totate Park is included in, somehow in the Blackstone River Valley, um, because of the work of a former selectman, Jim Fraser, who had got that in there. There's about five or $10,000 he got through them to try to do that. There's all these little pockets that you could try to obtain funding. And I think, you know, looking at about $150,000 to try to do something at Totade, um, I think that's a reasonable number. I think it's something that we should do. And again, <coughs> for the impact that it'll provide the town and a positive uh, impact that it'll provide, I think, it's, I think it's a good idea. But again, that's the town helping itself. You know what I mean? But we talk about water district or some of the bigger stuff. You know, we talk about the bond bills and being shovel ready. And you know, doing well, see, this is, together as a town. And this is what where also this is also where um, <coughs> you know, I was lucky four years ago. We've just before the year that we did these bond bills. Um, I was on higher education, um, vice chair of public safety, ways and means, uh, and I think I was on. Um, I'm forgetting the, the fourth one, and then it might have been work. Oh, um, it was um, state. Um, it was. Um, I forget. I just came in and left. God. Um, but just anyway, so the new session comes like it was in January. So the former Senate president um, releases the committees. I got the I got what I wanted, and then um, which was I, I pretty much wanted the same four. Then she also put me on three other committees, so I, I went from four to to seven, and one of them was really two because it's a. It, uh, Ways and Means is really two because it's a joint committee and it's a uh, it's a standalone committee. Mm -hmm. So. Um, so your Senate <coughs> ways and means, then your joint ways and means. Two yeah. sets of yes. hearings, yeah. different meetings. <coughs> so, but the, the, the benefit was she they put me on state bonding and um, public ads, state bonding and assets. Um, they put me on the transportation, and then I was on um, uh, workforce and labor. But the important part about it was the state bonding committee. All those bond bills, um, that from the transportation to the environmental to um, we did a general bond bill, all originated and start in the bonding committees. So being on the committee, it really gave, it gave you know it went from like what did I do wrong to she did me she did 
me and my district a favor because I got first I got pretty much first ask ac ass access access thank you access to getting projects in the to getting projects in the bond bill. So um, it went from like oh my God she's overloading me to you know this is great and we were able to uh, we were able to get a lot of projects funded. So you're getting some good experience in there. It's I don't know if people think it is, man, but it's not what people think it is. It's very, very large maze to go up there to and Boston, and you know the federal level being what it is. Yeah. Try to get in there and be state senator. It's a large district, but it's also a something bunch of different interests, and try to navigate and learn how it works. Learn how it works, and it's also something that okay, yeah, there, it, it's something that if you look at what I could get accomplished, what I got accomplished last year, last term, compared to hopefully what I got accomplished this term, but to my first term, is vastly different. Mm -hmm. I mean. There's, there's a lot more I can get accomplished now because you're saying you know the people, you're on different committees, you have you've, you've uh, know the process and how to get things done. Well, if you can't get a bill done this way, I'm going to do it this way. You don't necessarily have to get a bill passed. You can try to do it with regulation. Um, there's different avenues to try to effectuate this result and yeah. learn. How long have you been in there now? Uh, eight years. Eight years? <coughs> yeah. It's a quick eight years, huh? <coughs> yeah, it has. Yeah. But uh, so in our, you know, in our closing minutes here, um, Anything that's the primary focus going forward here, you know, anything well, um, you're looking at in the next session? Just yeah, briefly. Well, um, well, I guess right now the biggest, the biggest thing um, is probably my one of the bills I've worked the hardest on. That um, I w uh, so it's probably one of my biggest disappointments so far. But um, also, uh, uh, I had some uh, um, positive success with it. Was um, we did a bill? Uh, I did legislation. At two years ago, right this time, uh, dealing with um, sexual assaults on college campuses, and we did a lot of uh, research. We took other bills across the country, and there's, there's a few states that have passed it. Um, we were able. We met with op opponents of the bill, advocates of it. <coughs> uh, we filed this again two years ago, and because of more relationship problems between the House and the Senate, we weren't. A we were a finally able to get the bill passed in the Senate at the, at the very end of the Senate se awesome. at the, the session. But as of right now, <coughs> in five, five minutes now, um, the Senate might be getting out of session. The House has, hasn't acted on the bill. So I'm going to have to refile the bill. Um, so I'm happy that I, I was able to get the bill through. Through the Senate. Senate. Now you know, I can work on it again uh, next session, but I want to see that through. But I will say also that with, with this bill, um, I was able to get funding in the budget two years ago. Hundred thousand dollars for um, the Board of Higher Education, and they to do a to bring in national experts on campus safety and campus safety regarding sexual assaults and also um, just violence on campus. So they came out with a report uh, last I think it was June, um, and I will say this: you know, you know, usually most reports that are, that come out, you have the report come out and the legislation is drafted. Uh, I was going to say I felt more vindicated by what I was trying to do because if you read that report that came out, it contained everything in our bill. Everything that we had identified in the bill that had to be done was, was uh, contained in our legislation. So, you know, it makes you feel good. It's okay. That you nailed thing. it right on the head. Yeah, it really did. Um, I, yeah. Couldn't, I couldn't have asked for something that supported them more. And one that I appreciate is that, you know, the raising of the small claims cap from five to seven well, helps me out a lot. Oh, I appreciate thank, you're that. You're welcome. I appreciate that. You're welcome. So, um, yeah, State Senator Mike Moore, live here from the LCAC studios. Uh, we really appreciate it. We have Sunday morning playing him. basketball. Sunday morning, town hall gym, where yeah. I played bitty basketball and it was terrible. Hopefully he puts on a better display than I could put well, on. Depends on the day. But I uh, just want our parquet and Lucky Margadonna, but uh, especially Art, always here and very accessible, allowing us to come yeah. in here and do this. He comes in, he shows up, he sets up the uh, he sets up the opening, he, get, he brings water, he jack of all trades. Thank you very much. And he does it because he enjoys it. <coughs> you know, people that want to be involved in town, there's a list of vacancies for committees uh, that you want to join on the Town of Lester website. What I do want to plug for Art, though, is the Hearts for Heat. It's a great organization they're having on February 2nd, 2017. Uh, this February 2nd, which is a Thursday at 7 p.m. at Hezekiah Stone's Coffee House in Rochdale. There's going to be an open mic. Now, we've got some local notables here. Uh, John Young uh, from Poor Man Stew, Matt Marcel, uh, another Lester uh, favorite here. Very talented individuals coming in, and they're going to try to put on um, a pretty good show to try to benefit people uh, who are having a hard time paying for heat. So uh, if you can get down there, again, uh, 7 p.m. They're looking for local talent. I may try to throw my hat in the ring, and it's been a while since I've busted out the guitar, but we may dust it off. 
we may come up with something else. But in any case, um, we hope to see you down there, uh, Hezekiah Sun, on the February 2nd at 7 p.m. If you have any questions, feel free to talk to Art Paquette. And um, I just want to, again, thanks, Mike, for having me on the show. Yeah, no, my pleasure. I want to thank the Shiv for having me on the show. The Shiv. The Shiv. And uh, thank Art. Art. Lucky out there, sitting out there. Um, and also, I also just want to thank um, the people in the school committee and the elected officials. Um, they're great to work with. Even your town, your town manager. Yeah, Kevin's great. Kevin's a great guy. Um, um, I guess we're, we're happy he's staying here. Well, we're happy we have you here as well, Mike. We're happy to have you in Leicester when you come around. People say the world to you, and it's a good thing because you know you know how it goes out there. So, um, yeah, no, you know, thank it's, you. So it's we appreciate you staying above the fray and doing what you're doing. And again, six one seven seven two two fourteen eighty five. I believe is the number. Yes, it is. Issue an issue. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to see Mike's. Um, Legislation, again, you can set up Senator, S-E-N-A-T-O-R, Mike Moore, SenatorMikeMoore.com. You can check out my contact and my campaign issues. But if you have a constituent issue, 617-722-1485. Yep. Feel free to call my buddy Mike here. And also email Michael.Moore at MASenate.org. Well, Mike, I'm going to go back to representing all 170,000 of us. Uh, oh. But thanks for spending an hour here with us, uh, going over some stuff. My and, pleasure. Um, and we'll see you the next time through. All Mike right. Shevick here with your state senator, Mike Moore. And again, and, uh, the Shiv. Yeah, th thanks. And uh, we'll see you next time on the Citizens Corner.